Good morning to one and all of you. We kindly request all of you to take your seats. Dear participants and delegates, it's our pleasure to welcome all of you to the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. The Center for Policy Studies is a newly formed academic unit of the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and it is indeed an honor to have all of you here for the inauguration and inception workshop of the center. I now invite Professor Devang Kakkar, Director, IIT Bombay, Dr. Pratap Bhanu Mehta, President, Center for Policy Research, New Delhi, and Professor Sadish Agnihotri, Head of the Center for Policy Studies, to kindly take their seats on the dais. Now, we have Ms. Kadambari, MPhil student of the Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Bombay, who will present a bouquet to Dr. Prada Bhanu Mehta. I request Pratikshit, MPhil student of the Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Bombay, to hand over the bouquet to our director, <laughs> Professor Devang Kakkar. We have Sneha Swami, M.Tech student, Sitara, IIT Bombay, who will hand over the bouquet to Professor Agnihotri. <laughs> now, I invite Professor Devang Kakkar, respected director, IIT Bombay, for the opening remarks and inauguration of the center. Good morning and a very warm welcome uh, to this auspicious occasion uh, when we are inaugurating the newest center in IIT Bombay, the Center for Policy Studies. Uh, really glad to see uh, such a diverse and large audience at this inauguration. It's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who is really our chief guest. He's come all the way from Delhi for this. and. Uh, a very warm welcome to Professor Sukhatme, uh, Professor Mishra, Professor Anand, all former directors of IITs here. I was just mentioning very high concentration of IIT directors in this room today. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, this is actually a, a new and different kind of center that the institute is starting. Uh, the center actually aims to bring together people from different disciplines uh, to, you know, think about, do research on policies. Uh, and uh, over the years, it has been felt that many of the policies that are being made uh, do have a technology component. And uh, there are many faculty within the institute who have interest in thinking about these issues and you know, in making proposals and so forth. And several of the faculty have actually been serving on national committees and so forth in which these policies are made. So it was felt that you know, for many years actually there has been a discussion that we should have such a center uh, focused on policy. Uh, I remember one of the very strong proponents of this such a center was Professor Anand Patwardhan from the School of Management. And for many years, he had been telling me and uh, many of his colleagues that we should start such a center. And uh, so this discussion has been going on. Uh, this center is also unique because in many ways, uh, over time, the alumni uh, of IIT Bombay also got involved in uh, you know, the process for setting up the center. And we had one of the, uh, you know, so I would say a concluding almost meeting uh, of this uh, a little more than a year, or about a year ago, October, October of last year, at the uh, Global Business Forum, which was held in uh, Goa, in which many of the contours of this center were discussed and uh, finalized. Uh, and I'm really glad that from October to now, 
we have come to this stage. Uh, we have a new head of the Center for Policy Studies, Professor Satish Agnihotri. Uh, you all may know him, but he's the former secretary of the government of India. And you know, as his profession, he was you know deeply involved in making policies. And so he's going to head the center, and there are a large number of other faculty members who are also involved. Uh, I feel that uh, starting such a center is quite appropriate at this time in, our, in the stage of evolution of our institute. Uh, today, as you know, uh, we have grown in size. Uh, we are now 10,000 students plus in the institute. Uh, you know, our faculty strength has also grown to about more than 600. And there is an increasing diversity in the disciplines that our faculty work in. And uh, there are a large number of interdisciplinary areas uh, that our faculty are engaged in. So I think that there is a rich resource that can come together and essentially work on issues related to policy in this center. Uh, I have great hopes that uh, the center will do excellent work and uh, we look forward to a bright beginning for the center and uh, that it will take the name of IIT Bombay further. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I invite Professor Sadish Agnihotri, head of the department, to elucidate the idea of the center. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Khakkar, for those kind words. Uh, I have uh, come back to IIT, uh, partly also because I was uh, from IIT Bombay, uh, 1974 to 1980. I am also looking forward to this uh, center uh, taking shape. Uh, uh, no, m many people might be aware of this, that the discussion, as Professor Khakar pointed out, has been going on, I think, for about 10 or 12 years. And when I myself was uh, Director General Shipping in Mumbai, and I used to come to the campus quite often, I have been uh, part of some of uh, these discussions. This uh, idea actually got accelerated a uh, little prior to uh, the GBF meeting in Goa. And I think uh, Professor Contractor, uh, yeah, yeah, he's sitting there. He, he had been sitting in the green room and uh, pushing this idea quite uh, significantly. And in Goa, as uh, Professor Khakar said, the contours of this uh, got uh, finalized. And between October and uh, this is August, it's not a bad pace that we have come to this uh, particular inception workshop. Uh, uh, currently, the center comprises of uh, me and two, three of my students who are uh, voluntarily helping me out. And we are looking for both Ashiana and Abodana, that is uh, space and uh, budget. And I'm sure that that is around the corner. Uh, but we uh, decided that some of the activities should uh, start off without waiting for uh, these two entities. So this is the first uh, activity. We hope to uh, carry out what we call the development discourse, uh, which will be uh, probably a monthly uh, event where uh, five or six schools together will pool their resources and have eminent speakers uh, speaking on certain policy issues. But uh, what we are trying to do is it should result in uh, you know, some uh, high quality discussion papers because one of the um, caveats which uh, Professor Khakkar has uh, put, uh, he says end of the day I am going to measure how many uh, peer group reviewed, not just uh, published, but peer group reviewed quality uh, publications come out of the center. So that is one idea. The second idea is, I mean, th these are the baby steps that we will be taking. And the other idea will be to have an annual policy dialogue. Uh, this annual policy dialogue will be uh, fashioned on uh, the lines of what Professor Pranavardhan uh, does. Uh, he has these conversations between anthropologists and economists, though they are both on the social science silo, but they are quite apart. So we will also have these annual policy dialogues, uh, which will be conversations between the technologists and the sociologists. And hopefully, in third week of January, we will have the first annual dialogue, uh, which will probably relate to COP21, and that's uh, tentative. 
Then we also intend uh, going in for a doctoral program from July uh, 2017 hopefully and a master's program from July 2018. If we can fast forward it, it's a different issue, but that's, that's where uh, we currently uh, look at it. Uh, the idea of putting a timetable is that it tells you whether the train is late or before time or is arriving in time. If you don't have a timetable, then there is no uh, yardstick. So we have put for ourselves these timetables. Uh, there could be, uh, we could adhere to it or there could be um, uh, slippages as well. Uh, there are two, three um, different uh, things that we are doing. One is this is not going to be just one more competing think tank. Basically, we are trying to look at the collaborative efforts and I am quite happy to say that uh, other schools in the country are also appreciating this idea. Center for Policy Research itself is one and uh, later in the next session where uh, uh, Dr. Nauruj Dubash will be speaking, in fact, he said that he clearly sees a potential for collaboration between the CPR and uh, IIT Bombay on certain matters. Uh, Center for Gender Studies in Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy, they have also expressed interest. So we will be looking at a collaborative model, it's like a hub and spokes. We could be hub in some cases, but we could also be uh, joining some hub in other cases. Uh, uh, Professor Khakar mentioned about uh, presence of a diverse group. Uh, many of you who know the story of Kartike, who, who uh, finally led the uh, army of gods, Dev Sena. Uh, he was nurtured by, I think, six mothers. Uh, so this center also is going to be nurtured by HSS, SOM, Sitara, EAC Group, Energy, uh, uh, CSRE, Computer Center. So I think we, we will probably go from strength to strength. And this is just as well, because if you are talking in terms of collaboration with other policy schools, uh, we should also lead by example where different silos in IIT uh, work together because normally one of our banes in the field of policy is that we are pretty much like the Rajput warriors, each individually brave, sincere, courageous, but we have taken a vow that So I think that, that change probably uh, will begin. Uh, the other interesting aspect that we are doing is there will be a advisory committee which will uh, guide the center in its uh, initial years so in terms of research priorities, in terms of formulating the program. Uh, Professor Khakar has uh, quite uh, promptly approved the name of the members of the advisory committee. Uh, I take the liberty of uh, announcing their names even though we haven't received kubul, kubul, kubul from all six of them. But I think that's, that's just around the corner. Uh, Dr. Anil Kakorkar has very kindly agreed to chair that advisory committee. Then we have Professor Vasi uh, from the faculty side. Uh, Professor Parshuraman, director of TISS, has uh, agreed to be on it. Then we have Ashok Kamath, who is president of the Akshar Foundation. Again, H9, uh, late 70s. Uh, uh, then, uh, yeah, then we have uh, Padma Prakash, who is editor of the e-social science and she was with um, APW for uh, uh, quite some time. And uh, we have, I think, yeah, that, that completes. Uh, that, and we have, of course, our own uh, uh, professor contractor, the Green Room Wala, uh, who has also agreed. So uh, you, you will also notice today in the you know, workshop, inception workshop that we have done, there is a kind of a running theme. The pre-lunch session essentially looks at the historical backdrop in terms of policy making. Uh, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta, in fact, is quite concerned as to how does this critical mass gather in the field of policy uh, with uh, kind of a quality output. Uh, Anindya Chaudhary and Nauroj will be talking about you know, the larger canvas. Post lunch, we are actually looking at a very interesting sequence where you will have some speakers uh, raising this problem that there is data inadequacy. Either data are not there or if data are there, they are not adequately analyzed and if they are analyzed, they are not taken cognizance of. And quite often we have a problem that a policy gets uh, decided first and evidence gets retrofitted and I think we need to move away from that. Uh, but then you have the ground reality that uh, with the available data you have to make do and make inclusive policies. So that is a theme which Professor Parshuraman is covering. Uh, 
and finally uh, who else but uh, secretary department of statistics and uh, program implementation professor anand uh, he is going to uh, tell us as to why should we care about evidence at all so i think there will there will be a running theme uh, we are quite overwhelmed by the response uh, and uh, one alumni comment which uh, professor contractor drew my attention to uh, is worth mentioning before i close uh, and it said ki acha itni jaldi kuch cheeze ho jati hain so i think we have well begun but uh, i always remind me of the murphy's law statement on this uh, it says that well begun remains half done if you don't follow it up so we 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 hope to uh, follow up uh, so with that i uh, close uh, my overview of this particular center and i would uh, invite uh, dr pratap bhanu mehta he is a political scientist who taught at harvard jnu and uh, new york university school of law his research areas include political theory constitutional law society and politics governance and political economy and international affairs and he has served on many committees and boards so uh, who else but uh, dr pratap bhanu mehta for this um, title of uh, policy making in india the ought versus the is it's a mischievous title but i think we will have a lot of insights uh, thank you professor mehta thank you professor uh, agnihotri uh, professor khakkar it's a true privilege and honor to be here uh, it's really a wonderful moment uh, i assume not just for iit uh bombay but i think for the larger sort of field of public policy to have a new center come up in such a distinguished uh institution um and let me tell you i think the expectations are going to be very high of this center uh because of the institution in which it is located uh many of us have felt i think many of my colleagues at cpr share this view that actually a lot of these centers should be in either in universities or institutions larger than think tanks if they are to be on a sustainable course uh unfortunately i think the institutional experience of those centers has not been up to full potential and we are hoping that iit bombay will actually break the mold and and trend so um congratulations and uh you know uh, I, i think we look we look forward to these um uh, proceedings um the uh, proceedings of the center the mandate i was given and frankly it was a very hard one to think about what it was was by professor agnihotri the title is his is an art uh and he insisted on that title i wasn't even sure what it actually means uh, so maybe part of what i'll talk about is what it means but what i thought i might usefully do in the next half an hour or so i mean this is not an occasion for a conventional academic paper or a research paper is to perhaps try and in very broad brush strokes kind of situate the context of policy making institutions particularly in india what are some of the large transitions uh that provide the historical epistemological background against which our policy discussions are actually taking place and it's a backhanded way of answering the is ought question because conventionally in philosophy when the distinction between is and ought is made which goes back to david hume uh the is ought distinction actually inaugurated a kind of real split between morality and the, the world of nature and the world of morals right so the idea was that what is uh does not lead you to be or or does not entitle you to deduce what ought to be the case right so there's nothing about the facts in nature that allows you to deduce what ought to be morally right and wrong that was the kind of the you know the beginnings of modern philosophy and this uh, it's it's still arguably the biggest sort of uh, uh challenge about the thinking of the relationship between normativity and natural facts and i'm not going to kind of bore you with the philosophy lecture but one possible resolution to the is ought distinction which is i, I just have to kind of laid out on the table before i come to the talk uh actually was inaugurated in the 19th century in the kind of response to immanuel kant uh, beginning with hegel and then later on with marx which tried to resolve this question of is and ought by trying to ask one question which is is there something in the process of history itself a kind of dialectical historical necessity that itself produces an answer to the ought question 
right? So the odd question doesn't free float in air where we simply say, look, no matter where, you know, what the process of history is or what the facts about the world are, right? I can always imagine an alternative universe. Uh, that alternative imagining has to be grounded in some understanding of a kind of dialectic of history out of which the broad framework of what is rational, what is universal, what is necessary actually emerges. And in the 19th century, there were various candidates for what is rational, necessary, and universal, uh, the modern form of the state being one of them. That no matter what else you might think about, right, what ought to be the case, should we live in federations, should we live in small scale communities, should we live in, you know, sort of small democratic assemblies, the fact of the modern state and what it actually makes available to us as citizens, the different kinds of identities it makes available to us, um, is a kind of dialectical necessity that is emerging out of history. And really the task of public policy is to make sure that it happens with the least pain possible. Because if you try and again go against that grain of necessity, you won't have, in a sense, the agency to overcome it. right? So what I thought in the spirit of sort of answering this question is, you know, what are some of the big transitions that we more or less take for granted as backgrounds to our policy discussion, right? Uh, and I think because it's the, it's the creation of a new center, it's always fun to sort of revisit the foundational questions rather than kind of, you know, uh, get lost in the, in the technical nitty gritties, which, you know, which are important in their own right. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll gesture what I think to be the, the four major transitions. Um, I'll pose a question about each one of them and maybe talk in a little bit detail about the governance and the institutional one, partly because that's closer to my, uh, my, my area of interest. So at one level, the story of sort of progress over the last two, three hundred years, uh, I've presented in the slides in a very, very stylized form. Uh, these are ideal types. These are heuristic aids to thinking about the transitions we are experiencing. Uh, obviously, reality is much more messy. Uh, but I think these ideal types in some ways kind of form the backdrop of the questions we are asking and the assumptions we can bring to bear on what policy choices are available to us. So the first transition, which is the economic transition, is a very familiar one. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's almost platitudinous to repeat it, but, but I think it is worth asking whether that story that we thought was a platitude has been borne out, which is there's going to be a transition from an agrarian to an urban society, agrarian society to a manufacturing society. In agrarian societies, your occupations and identities are aligned in the sense there's very little possibility of social mobility. Modern societies produce a new form of social mobility. The transition from rural to urban, from low productivity to economies to high productivity economies, and a transition from broadly an economy where you are at the mercy of nature to something like the project of mastery of nature. Right? That was supposed to be the economic transition of modernity, I mean, very simply put. I think one of the interesting challenges, and I'm posing this as a question, this is not a categorical statement, uh, is whether we are at a stage in our economic thinking where a lot of the assumptions that form the backdrop up to that transition to modernity are actually coming under question, which provides an opportunity for us to think radically differently right, about what policy tools we need and what uh, paradigms we bring to bear. In particular, I want to kind of focus on sort of three particular aspects of this economic transition. And I'll just gesture at the questions. These are, you know, this is a tour of perplexities, not a kind of guide for the perplexed. So the first transition, which is that all throughout the 19th and 20th century, even now there's a big debate around it, there was broadly an assumption that you could design an economic architecture for the world in which growth, productivity, and employment will all go together, right? So economies could continually grow. They could grow in productivity. Uh, and there's a big debate about the nature and character of that productivity. Robert Gordon has just made this argument that, you know, 
the, the kind of productivity growth you saw between 1870 and 1945, 1950 was actually an aberration in human history. Um, and more recent productivity growth does not really actually match up to that, right? But there was a broad idea that productivity growth and employment actually go. Can, you can make them go together if you design public policies well, right? I think one of the interesting things about this intellectual moment, and I think this moment in history, is that a lot of people are beginning to question whether this was actually an article of faith rather than a kind of emerging necessity uh, you know, that should shape the horizons of our thinking. Uh, it's been questioned at all levels. It's been questioned, as I said, in the way Robert Gordon has articulated whether the kind of productivity growth that we take for granted as the bedrock of the transition to modernity, right, in that particular historical period of capitalism, can that productivity growth be actually taken for granted, right? At least the rate of that productivity growth, right? And his argument is actually that the services revolution, for all its other advantages, actually does not match up to the kind of productivity growth that let's say the elect you know, generation of electricity and those kinds of things did in the late 19th century, right? The second leg that is beginning to be questioned, which is even if you have a modest degree of productivity growth and some growth, right, overall growth in the economy, is the employment elasticity of capital going to be such to be able to actually generate full and productive employment, right? And we can actually have a debate about the nature of the kind of employment uh, that we are actually thinking about. I mean, I just put it up there in terms of, you know, there's a, there's a cliche going around that in the previous generation people, or in our generation, people used to ask, what job will I actually get? Uh, now you'll have to ask, what job can I create for myself, right? Uh, because the idea that there are actually stable organizational forms that provide lifelong careers, that whole kind of sociology of the organizational forms in which jobs were located is actually also being radically transformed, which has had a profound impact on politics, for example, the nature and character of the labor movement and so on and so forth, right? So the question of what kinds of jobs will be generated, right, and have growth, productivity, and employment, is that linkage coming apart in ways that we had not anticipated? Uh, or, or what we had assumed to be true about a particular phase of capitalism, right? Will that relationship continue to hold true as we go ahead? And it's interesting that I think across the world, whether it's China, whether it's the United States, certainly in Europe, there is actually beginning to be a big debate about this assumption. And this is a really large assumption because if growth, productivity, and em employment are actually being delinked, then you have to think about the development process, the kind of social protection you need in very different ways than the ones that we are actually accustomed to, right? So the first kind of intellectual challenge is, you know, are we in a phase where that, that transition is actually likely to happen, right? The second one, which Navroz will probably refer to, and everything I know about this subject comes from Navroz, is actually the relationship to nature story, right? Where rural economy is largely at the mercy of nature, then this great modern project, right? On which almost all engineering prowess and technological prowess was based, which is the mastery of nature, right? And remember, the project of mastery of nature was not just a technological project. It, it involved a whole range of assumptions about how to structure politics, how to structure ownership over natural resources, uh, how to think of nature, whether it's, whether it's part of a commons or whether it can be appropriated as private property. Certainly climate change, right, is forcing us to rethink those assumptions very radically, right? Uh, there is a view among some people that actually this does, doesn't require a very radical rethinking. Uh, ultimately, this is going to be reduced to a technological problem. A bunch of engineers will come up with a lot of smart solutions and we'll be actually, the project will be back on track. Uh, but there's increasing evidence that given the time scale at which we are operating, right, in terms of the climate change debate, uh, that may again be more an article of faith, right, a kind of modern secular theology uh, 
uh, than actual necessity emerging out, right? So, you know, I'm sure your energy center is kind of dealing with this uh, at this moment. But you are at that moment, I think, where a lot of what we used to think of as historical forces of necessity in terms of how we structure the economy are looking more like theological assumptions, um, which we have extrapolated from a particular phase of capitalism. And the question is whether they will obtain. The second big transition, which is again a relatively straightforward one for you know, students of modernization, uh, was the transition from pre-modern forms of political imagination, you know, including empires, small leagues, a whole variety of political forms, right, uh, which existed in pre-modern societies. And there's a really a bewildering variety of them. Almost all of them eventually came to be replaced by the modern idea of the nation state. Right? I mean, the fact of the matter is the nation state has become the dominant political organizational form of the 20th century, right? With all that it entails, nation state with the age of territoriality, right? Very important to all nation states, and you know, we are still grappling with inadequate territorial formations. The transformation of subjects to citizens that no matter whether you had dictatorships or democracies, all of them legitimize themselves in the name of the people, that there is some conception of legitimacy that involves the idea that uh, authority can be duly constituted only if it represents the people, uh, as it were, in some significant senses. Right? Uh, and often there was a phase in that consolidation of the modern nation states where these nation states were actually the creations of a process of empire and decolonization, right? Now, at one level, the outward form of the nation state, of course, still remains incredibly important to our democracy. I mean, it's hard to imagine actually an alternative at this point. I mean, the only thing worse than having a nation state is not having one, uh, I think as Hannah Arendt had pointed out uh, many years ago. But we are at an interesting historical moment where I think the assumptions we made about how representation and legitimacy is organized uh, in these nation states is also being seriously questioned by the kind of political forces that are emerging. Uh, this is a very complicated process, but I just want to talk about two elements of this, which I think are particularly relevant for uh, a school of public policy and our historical conjuncture in India. Right? One way of capturing the challenge, right, so to the idea of nation state whose legitimacy derives from the fact that uh, it claims representation, right, it, it manages to sort of represent the will of the people, is that most democracies are experiencing what you might call a wider gap between representation and legitimacy, right? So representation is simply the idea that decisions are made by some process of popular authorization, right? Elections, parliaments, legislative assemblies, various forms of representation. And yet, when those decisions come out, they still seem to lack legitimacy because all of us reasoning as free and equal individuals do not say about those decisions that we accept these decisions as free and equal individuals, as as the setting the terms by which we want to live under, right? So this gap between representation and legitimacy, and I think it is particularly true of Indian democracy, you could argue it's true of the United States at the moment, where it's not that our democracy is not deepening. I mean, electoral contests are still deep, voter participation is still high, and all the conventional measures of representative politics, right? We might hate politicians, but we still love politics, right? Uh, the processes of democracy are very robust and powerful. And yet, if you ask the question, are we producing public policies that we would consent to as free and equal individuals, most of us would say no, right? Uh, which has all kinds of repercussions. It raises the cost of enforcement, right? Because typically, policies that have, have less legitimacy will either be subverted in practice, or the state will have to deploy more and more forms of coercion to actually police them, right? So broadly speaking, there is this kind of gap between representation and legitimacy 
sort of opening up in most democracies. And this gap has always existed. It's part of the adventure of democracy itself. How do you actually design democratic institutions in ways in which the gap between representation and legitimacy actually closes? But there are two particular wrinkles to this gap uh, that I think are particular to our moment uh, that I just want to sort of gesture because that does form a context of uh, policy making. So the one particular wrinkle has to do with one very basic bedrock that has always formed the basis of legitimacy in a democratic society, which is called public opinion, right? So again, to oversimplify a story, this is, I mean, I'm just doing it as crudely <laughs> as, as, as one possibly can. Uh, you might say that in democracies, right, in part politicians close the gap between representation and legitimacy by responding to something they call public opinion, right? It's another way of capturing the idea that decisions should be legitimate in the eyes of the people, right? Now, it's turning out to be the case that this concept of public opinion is actually trickier than we, what we thought it was. Now, professional economists always knew that the concept of public opinion was very tricky because uh, beginning with Arrow's impossibility theorem, but, but, but in a variety of different contexts, wherever you have a large number of actors, preferences across different vectors, right? Uh, actually creating a matrix of what trade-offs people actually prefer, right? was never actually easy um, uh, in any kind of um, uh, straightforward algorith al algorithmic sense. But more and more, the structures and processes by which public opinion is generated and represented in society have become increasingly problematic. Because one of the interesting things about public opinion as a concept, as Alexis de Tocqueville had pointed out in the 19th century, is that it's an extremely reflexive concept. When he talked about the tyranny of majority, he had two worries in mind. It wasn't just the tyranny of majoritarian numbers, that you know a larger group of people may impose its will on a minority. Uh, to some extent, that's a correctable sort of danger. His deeper worry about public opinion and the tyranny of majority is that we actually begin to shape our preferences by assumptions we make about what public opinion is, right? Uh, the most farcical and facetious example of this is, of course, what you see on nightly TV, right? Uh, and it's a problem facing all democracies where if you say, how do I know what public opinion is, right? Who actually represents public opinion, right? Is it somebody claiming to speak on behalf of the nation? We are, we are almost uh, you know, at, a, at a point where there is a kind of Jacobin representation of public opinion, which is, again, it's not an accident that you've had this kind of the rise of demo demagogic politics all over the world, right? Because there is this longing for some conception of a unified public opinion that is unmediated, untextured, uh, completely sort of independent of all these messy representative processes that we have actually set up. But even if you look at a very practical point of view from the point of view of politicians, right? I mean, you have to pity them. I mean, they have the hardest job in the world, uh, particularly most Indian members of parliament. You know, if you ask them, how do you guys know what public opinion actually is, right? The surprising answer is most of them actually will acknowledge we don't know. I mean, you know, Amit Shah said in an interview recently, and this is Amit Shah saying it, so it may, he said, I actually don't know how you win elections or lose elections, <laughs> right? There is some truth to that idea, right? Now, what it does to policymaking, right, and, and, and this is in a sense the, the challenge, is if your political class for a variety of reasons, old-fashioned pol politicians used to have a way of understanding public opinion by being embedded in the communities to which they belong. Uh, in, a, in the context of a mediatized public opinion, the concept of which community you are embedded in has also become problematic. Uh, in the context of a more complex economy, uh, what trade-offs you think matter more to voters, right? Uh, 
uh, if I raise MSP, but I can, you know, give uh, alternative social security benefit, is that trade-off acceptable? Uh, does inflation in health or education matter more than inflation on telephone calls? I don't know what the what that what that story is. That the processes through which public opinion is beginning to be represented, and by and large, there's a danger because of the structure of the media that it is actually taken over by. Right? As, I call, as I call it, the Jacobin idea of public opinion, that public opinion is simply whoever can yell the loudest that this is actually public opinion. But its reflective, reflexive effect is that if enough politicians come to believe that that is in fact public opinion, then you actually have a problem. Right? The second aspect of this transition, this legitimacy representation gap, has to do with a phenomenon that political scientists provocatively call post-democracy. Uh, and there are two people in this audience who've written a lot on this without using the term Navroz and T.C. Anand. T.C. Anand's uh, sort of prior work on kind of regulation and institutional transformation. Where, as you know, in the 1980s, between 1980s onwards, uh, with the rise of the administrative state, the structure of the state itself became more and more complex, right? And one form in which that complexity manifested itself was the incredible rise of the regulatory state. A whole proliferation of new regulatory institutions, right? Not just a proliferation of new regulatory institutions, but a shifting of balance of power uh, between representative institutions and unelected institutions. Think of the court legislature battle right now. Right? Uh, again, by the way, that's not a phenomenon unique to India. You know, when Rand Herschel says the rise of the juristocracy was a global phenomenon, right? Many people feel that it raises some fundamental questions about how representation and legitimacy is actually being organized in modern societies, right? Now, at many levels, there was a good rationale for this fundamental transformation in the architecture of the state, right? away from a reliance only on legislatures to creating this complex gamut of regulatory institutions. I'm sure Mr. Agnihotri has created a few in his time, right? There was an economic theory behind it. Uh, you could actually talk of efficiency gains that come from these institutions. There was a theory of legitimacy behind these institutions. The theory of legitimacy was that these institutions by insulating decisions from the normal representative process, which was deemed to be corrupt, which was deemed to be hostage to individual interest groups, actually may produce more legitimate outcomes because these regulatory institutions are forums of reason. These are not forums of interest, right? So where does a court's legitimacy come from? It's not an elected institution, but insofar as a court's when it pronounces on policy matters, right? By and large, the, the credibility of the court's claims will be manifest in the quality of the reasoning that the court brings forward. So when we look at a court decision and says, yeah, yes, this is all things considered the best possible decision. It has taken all points of view, taken considerations on board. It's well reasoned. You know, we are more likely to consent to it, right? But the experience of that administrative state has, to put it mildly, been a very mixed bag. The hope that this regulatory apparatus would be the site of reason as opposed to the site of interest. That was the theory behind it. It's a, it's a different question whether that distinction can be made as easily as we thought it could. It turns out we can't make that distinction easily. Is actually generating a new kind of crisis about the legitimacy and effectiveness of state institutions. And I'll just end with this point on institutions and, and then just make one more point and, and finish up. One manifestation of that crisis, one manifestation of that crisis is that post-1991, right, what was supposed to happen with the reform process? One of the things we were supposed to have sorted out was what is going to be the role of the public and what is going to be the role of the private, right? That is what, broadly speaking, reform meant, right? Uh, where do you get the public sector out of? Where do you get the state back in? 
But if you look back in retrospect, right, in 2016, to my mind, my biggest worry about the Indian state is, I think that story looks even messier now than it did in the 1990s. And it looks messy in one very particular way because uh, if you ask the first principle questions, right, a state is an entity that exercises coercion and is backed by democratic legitimacy. The private sector's motive is profit. It's governed by market principles, and so it should be. I mean, I don't think you should expect it to do anything else, right? And the civil society's job is to, in a sense, generate a new form of creativity by a kind of voluntary persuasion. That's the only tool civil society has, right? Now, each of these principles requires a different structure of accountability. What is true of the state cannot be true of the private sector, right? What is true of the private sector cannot be true of civil society, right? That's why you call it non, not for profit, for profit, right? Now, we have ended up in a state structure where, frankly, the roles and the institutional architectures are so mixed up, right? Where parts of the state think their job is revenue maximization. On the other hand, we are expecting, right, the markets and corporations to actually perform the role that the state did, right? Uh, we impose the role on them, and then we say we will actually create structures of accountability for them. So, you know, when 50% or 60% of the Consolidated Fund of India actually gets rooted through corporations and NGOs, at one level it's right for the state to say, we will hold you accountable. But you know, here's the problem. Boss, the whole point that made those sectors vibrant was that they had to be subject to different standards of accountability, right? Asking a corporation to behave like a state, or as the Supreme Court is in some cases doing, asking the state to behave like a corporation, is actually getting things mixed up in a way that is, I think, fundamentally detrimental to the rationality, the administrative rationality of a modern state. And I would submit to you that that regulatory debate about what structure of accountability is appropriate to what organizational form, right, is now seriously confused and seriously up for grabs. I mean, it is really kind of, you know, whatever works. I mean, there's, there's no kind of integral, art, integral integrity, intellectual integrity to these uh, architectures that we are, uh, in fact, uh, uh, designing. Uh, this is true in, so, you know, you have this kind of, you might say, uh, uh, a kind of confusion emerging in the basic regulatory architecture of the state, but it's emerging in a democratic context where the gap between legitimacy and representation is growing, right? And, and you will see it manifest in all kinds of social movements and sort of social fissures. I mean, uh, I think what's happening in Gujarat, in a way, is, uh, uh, is a canary in the mine, uh, 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 you know, uh, just as what happened in Gujarat 10 years ago was a, was a kind of canary in the, in the mine. Uh, and I think that poses a particular challenge for public policy, right? It poses a public challenge for public policy in the sense that 5, 10 years ago, I used to be actually more confident when we did our first edition of Public Institutions in India, a book I'd edited with, co edited with Devesh Kapoor, Navroz as a contributor. I think we sort of knew what the processes were, even if you agreed or disagreed with them. I'm actually less confident what those processes are now. What is the fundamental relationship between the civil service and the elected arms of government? Uh, Ten years ago, there was at least a debate about the proper architecture of decentralization. Right? Very imperfectly done, but you sort of said this is the incremental path towards the 73rd and making the 73rd and 74th Amendment a reality. You know, despite the talk of cooperative federalism, that part of the decentralization debate is now pretty much off the agenda, right? In case you haven't noticed, right? So you are at a time where the context that policy takes for granted, that there is a stable institutional frame whose architectural design, both in terms of the normative basis of that institution, 
and the structure of accountability that's actually appropriate to that institution, they're all completely up for grabs. And I actually think this crisis will deepen. We are already seeing one manifestation of it in the judiciary legislative tussle, right? Yeah. Uh, the last and final point I'll make, and then kind of, I, I won't go through all the, the so with the 1991 story, apart from this institutional transition, the economic transition was supposed to manifest itself in two different large shifts. One is the shift from crony capitalism to rules-based capitalism. And we can debate how much of that shift has actually taken place. But the second parallel transition, which provides a big context for contemporary policy debates, right, is the transition from our old system of welfare to a new architecture of welfare. Let's be very clear. Any liberal democratic society will and should, this is both an is and an ought, right? Have a robust system of social protection and a robust system which empowers people to actually participate in the economy. I mean, you cannot gain legitimacy in a liberal democracy if you don't have it. I mean, I don't think we should even debate that proposition. The debate is really over what should be the architecture right, of that welfare system. And the two big ideas that are on the block, one is a delivery format. The delivery format is we need to move to direct cash transfers. Right? Uh, the normative basis of that, eventually leading or potentially leading up to, is potentially contemplating the idea that should the state guarantee an individual a certain minimum basic income? Right? The Swiss have just voted it down. But you know, it's interesting, lots of Pranab Bardhan, Vijay Joshi, Vijay Kelkar, a whole bunch of economists are actually now openly mooting the idea of should India have a guaranteed basic income story? In part because it helps with the first problem, which is that if you particularly if you can't guarantee jobs. Should the state actually guarantee a minimum basic income? Uh, I won't take a stand on the debate. The only thing I would say about that debate is that if we look upon direct cash transfers as a kind of substitute for the state, right? that somehow what it will allow you to do is bypass the pathologies of the state that I actually just talked about, then I think we are in for big trouble. Because my, my worry about the cash transfers debate in India is that it's framed as if, right? What it will allow you to do is bypass a leaking, corrupt, low capacity state. In fact, the opposite is true. The more you empower people in that way, the more it is that you will require the state to actually build robust institutions, right? that can actually service the demands that will arise out of this transfer. But, but, but that's going to be the, the big sort of defining debate in the time. And the last and final point, this I'll end with, particularly in 2016, India, I think, has to be said, which is all of these big transitions, right? I mean, the fun about living in our times is these foundational questions are open again, right? It's no longer a question of sort of little technical tinkering here. These will define our politics. You'll get lot of energy in new kinds of social movements. The last and final one is, this is happening in India in the context where two ideas of India are in a decisive conflict with each other. The way I characterize that conflict is not as it's conventionally characterized as the conflict between Hindutva forces and secular forces. To me, that's just a symptom. That's not the underlying cause. The conflict is between two different imaginings of India. One imagining of India, which imagined India as a federation of communities, right? So when we talk of the diversity of India, India is a mosaic of diverse communities, you know, all of that absolutely wonderful idea, and you know, you, 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 you want to create the conditions that maintain and preserve those diversity. Nobody should be targeted for being who they are. But one of the weaknesses, of that formulation right, of the idea of India was that that idea of India was not geared to an idea of freedom that modern society requires. Right? So our traditional conception of toleration, right, where 
we allowed diversity was very frankly segmented and hierarchical. Each community has a place so long as it stays in its place, right? The burdens it placed on us were actually not very onerous because it did not require the kind of intimate engagement with other people, partly because you know, your social identities were fixed, your place in society was fixed, there wasn't great economic mobility, right? Uh, but as society modernizes, right? As people become more mobile, the burden of toleration is actually going to become much more intimate. It's one thing to say abstractly, right? Uh, you know, don't target minorities. Don't target Muslims for being who they are. They have a place in the society. They're part of the mosaic of Indian culture. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to say, will I eat with them? What happens if intermarriage begins to become a reality? Right? It requires a very different imagining of that relationship where the point of diversity is not to preserve community identities. The point is to create the space and freedom so that people who want to transgress them can transgress them freely. Right? Right? And even the Congress idea of India, right? Why, why say in some senses, it's, you know, the, often the joke is that the difference between the Congress and the BJP is both had a communitarian idea of India. The Congress thought it could run majority nationalism and minority nationalism together, right? BJP just said, why do we, you know, why do we need that minority bit, right? What neither of them is committed to, right, is a commitment to the idea of individual freedom. And the idea of individual freedom is very simple. I mean, look, you have tons of scholarly work in Indian universities, which frankly annoys me a great deal, which keeps telling us liberalism is not an Indian idea, right? This is a Western import. We have a different conception of secularism. To my mind, that's just patent nonsense. And why is it patent nonsense? It's patent nonsense for the following reason. To my mind, the core liberal value is, as far as possible, nothing should be imposed on you which you do not consent to. Right? Okay. This is a core moral intuition that a lot of us use in our lives in very different contexts. Even majoritarians, right, will often say, don't impose something on us, we don't agree with it. Minorities will often use it, right? All that a liberal society asks is that that core moral intuition, that as far as possible, don't impose anything on us that we would not freely consent to, that courtesy be extended to every individual in society. Whether it's a community imposing norms on them, so communities will often impose, invoke this argument when they are resisting the impositions of other communities. Right? right? That core moral intuition, which says the purpose, the constitutional vision, which informs our secularism, is the idea that as far as possible you honor the freedom and equality of every, every individual. Right? and create the maximum room for their dignity and freedom. There's nothing Western about it. In fact, the West never practiced it actually you know, fully, right? I would submit, and if you look at the range of social conflicts bubbling up in India, you know, whether it's kind of from Gharwapsi to Dalit conflicts to Kashmir, at the core of it, right, is everybody in a sense wants to take recourse to this basic liberal intuition, right? I should be free to do whatever I will, so long as I'm not harming others. The only thing we are not willing to do is extend that curse to every citizen in India. And to my mind, that's going to be the defining conflict that shapes all of these other things as we move on. Yeah, I'm uh, Professor Amarendra Sahu. I did my political science from JNU and moved on to economics because I joined RBI. Now I'm back to academics. So I have traversed the whole gamut of the debate between state, civil society, public sector, private sector. Now when I go back and read the Chinese model again, 
this sort of dichotomy doesn't exist there. Yeah. You know, in China, the state dominates. There is no civil society. And the state decides what is the space of private sector. And the state has reformed itself by a communist country following capitalistic uh, you know, economic model very successfully. And we are trying, still struggling to cope with that. I mean, the debate between state, private sector, civil society, obviously we can afford that luxury of debate in India. But are we uh, really growing to that extent where we can reach near China? And China, mind you, is no longer a communist society. They are as capitalist, more capitalist than India is. So why do you always uh, define your discourse in the traditional stereotype model of state, public sector, private sector, civil society? Can we not uh, have a little different elevated model out of this and go nearer to China, if not follow that model? Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Rajesh. I'm a PhD student here in HSS. Uh, I, I do not have a very clear question, but a set of concern. I think this is not right occasion to raise such things. But in this debate of public, uh, public policy, like I see uh, there are certain think tanks, but they have commitment to some ideology. And like they are like, you know, contributing uh, like in policy making. And, and to this debate, like in the last corner, of the social, you are saying like you were talking about representation and legitimacy. So, but middle classes which are able to just you know get representation in this civil society are like you know uh, in public policy either in think tank, but uh, like rest of the people who are left out. So there is a segregation of some committed think tank in the present uh, prevailing condition in the country and some liberal leading think tanks and civil society representation and few left out groups like especially low income groups. So how you see their representation in the contemporary times? Uh, uh, my name is Surya Kant. I am a professor with, of sociology with the humanities. Uh, since the talk was kind of uh, expansive and th there's also an element of uh, some bit of uh, what you call as the present mess that we are in. Now, I was just uh, uh, you know, wondering if, if uh, we could distinguish this mess from, uh, of present times from the previous times in terms of scale. Because you finally come down to the importance of individual, mm. and, uh, which I really like, because that's the struggle that the society is engaged in. Because there are two parts of your talk. One is about uh, about this mess, uh, which where we don't have clear, distinguished boundaries, you know, and two, what also came through your talk was, you know, that policy making is an act within the given, given social and political, and where political class is important, so it finally kind of boils down to policy making as not an act of intellectual exercise but bureaucratic workings. Mm -hmm. So, what is intellectual about political making, you know, and how does one? Uh, sort this with the problem of individual because you also at times uh, somewhere else argue that you know maybe modernity is not the way out so so what is this tension i mean i just wanted to add a small bit to this trinity that you have talked about the uh, and the corporate the uh, civil society and the uh, government and this is someone else's description not mine and this was that the government suffers today from capacity deficit the civil society suffers from the scale deficit and the corporates suffer from trust deficit and each is trying to imitate the other. So whether uh, there's a way out on that. Let me take the China question first. Uh, so clearly any modern society and any robust intellectual space should be open to learning from a vast range of comparative historical experiences. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. And I think you're right that, you know, often we take certain templates for sort of granted. I mean, you know, 30 years of students kind of grew up on Harold Lasky and thought Harold Lasky is the only way of thinking about the state-society relationship. Although now I kind of have nostalgia for people who actually even remember that stuff. But uh, uh, so. In that sense, I think a wide range of experience. And one of the things I think historically, which is true, uh, 
Um, you know, often, you know, that joke that it works in practice, now we need to figure out how it works. It is true that a lot of social learning uh, actually happens after the fact. I mean, I think this is a point that John Dewey made, I think, most powerfully. Uh, and it actually goes to the question of kind of evidence-based make, you know, policy making, which is one way of thinking about that relationship, and this partly answers the second question, is to, you know, so there's a whole range of evidence that we will first gather, then we will decide what is the best model. Fact of the matter is, most of what happens to how, I mean, some things you can predict up front, some things you can determine by evidence, the intuitive ways of, not intuitive, the the research ways of figuring out, this cannot possibly work. But with large scale institutional design and intervention, right? Uh, how actually institutions get embedded in their context is something you often learn post, post facto, right? Uh, I'm actually very, very, very of the language of models. To extend your own argument, just as we should not look at the West as necessarily a model, I don't think we should look at China as a model. I mean, I mean that is to repeat the same fallacy that there's one model that didn't work, there's another more, right? Uh, the trick is not what models are available. There's a whole range of models available. Um, my resistance to the Chinese model would come partly from, I'll, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table, the resistance to the normative premises behind those models. Uh, uh, which is, uh, I, I do believe in individual freedom. Uh, um, um, I don't see a necessary incompatibility be between that and economic growth. I, I don't think that's the right diagnosis. And so it's not clear to me that we should actually commit to, in a sense, that model. And, and the various complexities of the model, the party system, the, you know, Hegel, you remember in the 19th century, a joke, China was all state, no civil society. India was all civil society, no state. Uh, uh, you know, many people still think that that historical legacy haunts both of our, uh, you know, our, 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 our respective um, democratic models. But the really interesting question uh, when you're making public policy interventions, and the reason I don't like the language of models, is, and this is a self-criticism about at least a certain part of academia also, it's the way we think, right? Most debates are other things being equal debates, right? That's how economic models are constructed. Ketris paribus, other things being equal, what's better, right? When you are making a public policy intervention, the question shifts in a very subtle way. And the shift is all things considered, which is very different from other things being equal, right? Uh, you can have a big debate, this goes to the second question in part, let's say, you know, there are people who are committed to privatization of education. There are people who strongly believe in public systems, right? Uh, to be honest, the evidence either way is never going to be knocked down or decisive. You can always find places where a bit of it has worked, it hasn't worked. Then you ask what circumstances, right? But there is a more interesting question to be asked, which we unfortunately don't get to as often, which is, to my mind, the debate between public versus private is perhaps somewhat less interesting. Then the harder question, OK, if you do want a public system, right? Or if you do want a private system to work, what else would have to be true about society for that private architecture to work, right? Now, in principle, it's possible that you might be normatively committed to a public system, but you can still actually contribute usefully to the second debate, right? I think the challenge with us is that we are not as good at that mid-range diagnostics. And that mid-range diagnostics, frankly, is not just a technical exercise, right? Uh, it's not just a technical exercise of gathering evidence. It's how do I design public policy in a context where, you know, my potential audience ranges from Maoists to fascists, with everybody else in between? What it would mean to actually create structures of articulation in public policy that can make all of these characters go along? <laughs>
right? So public policy at one level also requires the art of judgment, right? And the judgment, I mean, as I said, the, the, the crude philosophical way of putting it is an all things considered judgment, right? Uh, uh, I'll just give you one little example to, you know, and, and again, because TC Anant is here, it's, it's, it's provoking, you know, this is his early work on separation of powers. So when I put my academic hat on and I look at what the judiciary does, it's a travesty. And honestly, you, know, you can easily construct that argument. Uh, it's a travesty at many, very level, ma many levels, the constitution of benches, the arbitrariness within which constitutional decisions are being overturned. Uh, there's, a rap there's no stability in law anymore. I mean, that's actually the big worry about what the judiciary is doing. I mean, it's, it's become a lottery, actually. So the classic rule of law characteristic, right, which is predictability and certainty, I'm less and less confident, at least in the area of constitutional law, that I, I mean, I, I know what the courts will do next. The same judge can come out when, you know, in one judgment on free speech in the morning, another one in the afternoon. I have no idea what, what's going on, right? On the other hand, I can actually, you know, when I think about it politically, say, you know, maybe this is exactly the thing that has actually allowed the judiciary to be a stabilizing force in India. The, one of the reasons people go to judiciaries is because everybody thinks they have a shot, right? And if you actually ended up in an American style system, right, with incredibly first principle, deeply entrenched, you know, right? It may be that the losers, like losers in democracy, are democracy sustained because everybody thinks at some point they'll have some shot, at least of exercising veto or something, even if you can't create, right? So what makes for institutional stability, right, may be somewhat different from what my textbook, right? So often you, when designing institutions, when making interventions, you have to think about what are those all things considered, and which is where interdisciplinarity is important. I mean, which is where, which is why you need lots of different kinds of people in the room to actually force you to have you done an all things considered judgment, right? Now that in part is my segue to the, the, the more important part of your question, which is who gets to speak, right? And there's no question that almost all our spaces, except politics, which I think is the least hierarchical in some ways, right? Are extremely hierarchically structured on a whole variety of indicators, class, intellectual networks, caste, so on and so forth, right? And one of the reasons you actually want policy to connect back to actual deliberative processes is precisely for that reason. Because by their very nature, these institutions cannot be inclusive in that sense. It's not their function. I mean, it's their intellectual function to make sure that all the relevant arguments have been put forth. But the criteria of what counts as good work, right, is ultimately the inter internal integrity of an argument, the certain kind of evidential forms and so forth, right? So I would be very wary of a world in which intellectuals actually make policy. I, I mean, I would not want to wish that world. That would be probably closer to the Chinese fantasy that some people actually have, right? You want a world in which your deliberative processes are structured in ways in which most people in society can feel, yes, you know, we, we, we understand the process and what's coming out of it is something we think actually talks to us rather than simply talks at us. The question of ideology, you're right, many think tanks are ideological. Uh, and more than even think tanks, I mean, you know, Danny Roderick has this nice sort of uh, vignette, uh, which I think sums up the, I mean, the, the worry is often not the ideological ones. At least the point about ideological ones is they're transparent. Mm -hmm. You know what the American enterprise institution's answer to a question is going to be before the question has been asked, right? That's, that's the definition of being ideological, right? I think the bigger challenge for, I think, the knowledge-democracy relationship is you know, and, and the vineyard Danny Rodney gives, he says, look, when we teach trade theory, a good economist in class 
will be very careful about specifying under what conditions do what outcomes hold, right? In fact, in social science, there's only one question, actually, that runs through all of social science, under what conditions, right? I mean, that's one sort of thing. Uh, as a professional, that's what you're supposed to be doing. But the minute the Wall Street Journal calls up, right, suddenly that under what conditions has been simplified into a kind of formula that you actually translate across different contexts, right? And I think we need structures of accountability amongst ourselves that hold us to that professional standard, which is the issue is not, I mean, the normative ones are easy to spot. It's these very subtle slippages where what is actually a very conditional statement comes across as a much more unconditional recommendation, right? To my mind, that's actually a much bigger challenge for academia and academia's authority. One of the reasons people don't trust us is because they think academics have become compromised in this way, right? Uh, it's also part of a larger social phenomenon. I often find even across ideological lines, you know, if you talk to people over dinner about a policy matter, you'll find you agree 95% of the time, actually. Once you've specified under this condition, that condition, will this happen, not happen? When you start publishing papers, it comes down to about 70%. When you start writing columns, it comes down to about 50%. When you are in committee meetings, it's 30%. And when you're on social media, <laughs> the whole agreement is zero, right? So there is something about the context of that articulation, right? That is actually making the very conditional nature of knowledge, right? It seem much more ideological than it, in fact, actually, you know, uh, is. Um, your, your sort of last question, but partly was an answer to your question about kind of the bureaucratic sort of uh, thing. Uh, your <laughs> very important question. Um, I, I think that's a very powerful way of putting sort of, you know, the deficits all sectors are facing, although I, I suspect now we've also overloaded each with all the deficits. The state is also facing a trust deficit. Uh, Indian capital is also facing a kind of um, uh, uh, efficiency deficit. Uh, I think I'll just put it in the following way, which is, I think the pathology that we have got, we have subjected ourselves to in, in all three domains, which is one important part of a modern social contract, right, which allows liberty to flourish is what Michael Walzer called the separation of spheres. What you do not want is principles that are relevant to one sphere to contaminate the logic of other, right? So we worry about state capital relations because we do not want the process of democratic legitimacy formation to be subverted by the imperatives of capital, right? We worry about, and, and, and in the reverse direction, we don't want the creativity that comes from uh, private enterprise to be subject to a popular referendum. I mean, that, that, that's about, or we don't want academic production to be subject to a popularity contest, right? I think what's happening in our case is that each sphere, and this is not just the fault of the state, is actually exaggerating the premise which they want articulated in society to a point of pathology, right? So, Think of the accountability debate. I mean, just to go back to very familiar ter territory. Uh, as I said, I mean, you know, this recent controversy over NGOs being declared public servants and all of that. Now, at one level, it might seem like a small institutional matter, or, although it isn't, because it's actually a signaling of the Chinese model, which is we want to collapse the distinction between state and civil society, right? That's what it's actually leading towards, right? But What's missing from that debate is exactly that nuance about what is the purpose of an institution? What is the least intrusive way in which you can produce the right kind of accountability, right? So my friends in civil society, and we've wrought this restriction our, ourselves, we have made a mantra of transparency. And transparency is good. I mean, who can be against transparency, right? But in that zeal, we are not stopping to ask the question, 
transparency for whom, under what purposes, for what purposes, right? Should the norms of elected officials be different from bureaucrats? To my mind, they actually should be. I don't think they are also on the same level, right? right? Uh, Indian capital, just to end with this last thought, which is the state capital relationship in India is is at a very fraught moment where, you know, partly because of the anti-corruption movements, we thought there'd be a renegotiation of this relationship. And my worry is that it might actually turn out to be slightly easier to reform the Indian state than it'll turn out to be to reform Indian capital, <laughs> right? Which is Indian capital also has to understand what does it mean to operate in the context of a state seeking democratic legitimacy. Just as the state had to learn this, lesson of what does it mean to operate a modern economy in the context of private enterprise, right? So the conversation has to come from all three directions where you find, in a sense, the optimal point, right? Where those checks and balances are put in place. I think we'll uh, do that. Uh, thank you for saying that you don't want intellectuals to um, uh, do the uh, public policy. Because I think anyone who has doubt on this should reach, uh, read David Halberstam's book, The Brightest and the Best. And where he actually, he, he was a New York Times uh, correspondent, if I remember, and where he elaborates very um, uh, clearly as to uh, those 12 or 14 people who are the brightest and the best that the American establishment was uh, could uh, put on offer and how they led the entire nation into the Vietnam mess and coming out of it was very difficult. So uh, I think that point is well taken. I am Kanuma Rahman. I am from the Department of Civics and Politics, University of Mumbai. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask a question regarding your views on liberalism, but probably I'll yeah, talk to you later. But I'm just a little curious. You've put up a state... Uh, in the last column, you have abolition yeah, of gender. Yeah, yeah. So if you could actually explain or touch yeah, yeah. upon that. Yeah, I'm uh, Amit Agarwal, uh, batch of 95, uh, uh, graduate from IIT Bombay, currently working with Larson and Tubro. Uh, so the very interesting point which you made with saying under what conditions, right? So I mean, uh, any policy, really you have to uh, figure out uh, what the implications will be for, you know, cross-section of people, uh, you know, politic, I mean, social strata, income levels, all of that, right? So, uh, I mean, to what extent is it really possible to get it, you know, uh, exactly right or as close to uh, the best outcome as, as possible? And uh, also, I mean, in a, a little bit of a uh, just a thought saying, you know, uh, in future, uh, because you have so many prejudices and, you know, competing points of view and, uh, you know, things like that. But in, in future, I mean, is it actually possible to, uh, would it actually be possible to eliminate some of that by using, uh, you know, technology like artificial intelligence to, you know, take some of those calls? I am Anil Parekh. I passed from IIT Bombay 1972. Uh, sir, uh, your talk was at a very high level for me. Uh, I would like, I am staying in Worli. I have a very simple question. You know, they have made one bridge. I'm talking about infrastructure projects and, you know, this uh, policy making, what ought should be, what should be and what is there right now. They have made a bridge over there. I'm coming down to the ground level question to you which is, according to me, absolutely wrong. And they have just made such a big mess in that area. And there can be a design on paper which I can show. And I have shown to the police officers also over there that you don't need a signal light only over there. Instead of that, they have put so many lights and made the whole mess of it. Now, that's one thing. The point is, you know, when we are talking about policy making, now somebody has made the bridge. But behind that, there is an infrastructure that who allowed the design, who allowed the contractor, and all those things, you know, which go behind it. And if this new design which I'm talking about was made, the things would have been very simple and everything, it can be just, uh, you know, talked across the table and found that, you know, this is the right way to go. So this is what I understand is the, you know, the right policy making, where the infrastructure projects basically should be given to professionals, you know, and discuss in detail for the total outcome of that. 
because infrastructure is something which is you know for lifeline li- lifetime is not something small thing ki bhai aaj hua aur kal khatam ho gaya chalo wanda nahi kuch bhi kharab hua to bhi infrastructure cannot be like that you know this we are facing the problem today in worli area because of the wrong decision of that policy uh, makers so what i feel is that i would like to go down to that level and you know discuss things thank you sir the three question the last question essentially says how does the birds eye view and the worms eye view get reconciled um thanks for this question so so i i i did get to the gender i mean there's not time and you know um two two basic thoughts uh behind it right so one is um one way of thinking about that transition right conceptually was that there's an old system which we called for again oversimplifying patriarchy in the variation but right and in a sense the modern project is the overcoming of patriarchy by establishing some kind of equality uh 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 between men and women and then there's a kind of debate about what does that equality consist in is equality a sameness equality does it have to have an element of difference in it right that was broadly the and and then how do you create the sociological conditions where that equality is an actually uh, established institutional and sociological fact not just a conceptual thing right uh and that debate of course for country like like india i mean you know we are actually experiencing all of these together in right but there is a kind of next step as it were in that debate where people argue that even that formulation over overcoming patriarchy is actually too restrictive it's too restrictive because uh it actually still commits people in some ways right to a kind of public identity in terms of their gender and then lots of other things follow from that commitment the only thing that has changed is that instead of it being hierarchical it's now sort of equal but what has not changed right is the fact that that identity is a public actionable fact right now the the philosophical theory i mean this is the it may sound kind of very postmodern but is that why can't gender also become like other identities right so what produces other identities is actually a certain kind of performative character right so when we say two people are married uh, it's a social institution and it's a social institution that is actually created by all of us keep saying these two people are married right i mean it's the actual articulation of that fact you know in jail austin terms the 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 performative utterance that actually brings the institution to being and is it possible in principle to treat gender distinction like that that one of the reasons we have gender distinctions is because we keep repeating them over and over again right uh and now we you might say well we keep repeating them because they are actually natural distinctions therefore they map on to something right so there's that kind of metaphysical debate about it which you know is uh, i'm not competent to sort of adjudicate but the deeper institutional articulation of it is that do you want in a sense a public culture an institutional culture where actually gender ceases to be a kind of you know so just as we like to say look let people define whatever religion they are whatever caste whatever could we not have that analog about gender right that's kind of pushing at in a sense the 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 boundaries of it but but that's the sort of that's the radical and again it's 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 meant with a question mark but clearly there is the kind of pushing at that boundary as well of denaturalizing the category not just thinking of it in terms of 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 of, of, of um uh, equality uh your question about the bridge at <laughs> worli i agree with you it's it's it, it's the hardest question for social science to answer which is why we we are avoiding it but you yourself gave the answer uh and you yourself gave the answer in the sense that uh you know to my mind there's a big assumption in your question which 
I would not take for granted. And the assumption your question is that, you, that we all think, we all assume, that the purpose of the bridge is to get pe more people as efficiently across the bridge as possible, right? <laughs> now, what if you lived in a society where for a large number of public policy actors, that actually wasn't the point of the bridge, right? Uh, this is actually a real example. I mean, this, this, this was the kind of thing that, so infrastructure project comes to planning commission, right? What is the incentive of the bureaucrat or head of infrastructure in planning commission? There is one person sitting there who's saying, you know, what I need to worry about is the controller and auditor general's office. What assumption will he bring to evaluate the viability of this project, right? You as an engineer are telling me, if I make a four lane road, I should keep an extra half meter shoulder, right? CAJ will say, who's going to walk on the shoulder? What's the point of that, right? Why do you need a shoulder, right? The social meaning of that bridge for that particular officer is actually not, does it get the maximum number of people across quickly? The social meaning of that bridge for that person is, right? Have I done it at the lowest L1? in ways in which nobody can hold me accountable, right? One of the reasons Indian infrastructure, this is my colleague, I'm putting words in his mouth, my colleague Partho kind of says, is consistently underdesigned, right? Is because your decision-making structures, the social meaning of infrastructure for your decision-making structures is actually not designing infrastructure. It's a government, as you rightly said, off contractors, five con by contractors, four contractors. That's the first meaning of infrastructure. Why is infrastructure being built? Right? Once you come down that, it's a government of accountants, for accountants, by accountants. Right? So it's a good question we have to ask as a society. We are all assuming that the point of the, the point is not that. Who believes that the point of the bridge is getting people across? Right? The sociological challenge, and that's where you need a sort of public policy, you know, is, and, and that's where I think, an you know, the, the, the dialogue that Professor Agnihotri talked about is an important one. Because I actually do think Indian policy making has marginalized science and technology much more than it should have. That's the one thing I, I, I do think we should learn from a Chinese debate. I mean, the dominance of lawyers, Econocrats, right, and bureaucrats. The, those three, and, 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 and I don't mean in terms of their professional qualifications. Many of them are brilliant IIT graduates as well. <laughs> but, but in terms of the professional role they inhabit, right? I mean, part of the disaster you're getting is, I mean, is, 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 is because you're actually giving lawyers too much say about how to actually design legislation which is a lawyer's way of thinking about it, right? Not a, I mean, I, my complaint is you, 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 you know, my professional tribe says you need a political theorist in there to simplify the law to the normative core, right? So it goes back to that meta question, which is what is the structures of deliberation and what social meanings are the participants in that deliberation actually bringing? In most government committees, you are, just as an anthropologist, you'll have that experience, right? Consistently on this question of infrastructure under design, right? Planning Commission at some point decided its job was actually producing accountability, right? Its job was not producing great designed infrastructure, right? So the big challenge is do you have those decision-making processes which A, allow this conversation to actually happen, but which also then pro produces some convergence in the main social, in the social actors about the social meaning, right? Where the contractor can go away and say, look, you know, I think there's a way of building a bridge that actually also gets people across and making money, 
right? You square that circle. Uh, the accountant goes away saying, the fact that this is does not, not the cheapest bridge, right? It actually has a more imaginative conception of design, is not going to, is, is not going to come in the way of me having a reasonable career, right? Is not going to put me at the mercy of the CBI at some point. Uh, how do you produce that convergence of social meaning and mutual confidence? So we are back to the larger question. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta. I think we were, I was anticipating that you will tell us the potholes on the road, but you have forewarned that for this uh, Center for Policy Studies, we may encounter uh, much bigger gaping holes, absent bridges, and in some places probably the road itself may be absent. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the session, sir. Now, uh, may I request Professor Devang Khatkar, Director IIT Bombay, to pre present Dr. Prada Bhanu Mehta, a small token of our love and appreciation. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I invite Professor Contractor to present the vote of thanks. Let me uh, thank, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mehta for, for this uh, morning's presentation. And uh, also on behalf of the alumni and the, you know, GBF team, uh, I'm really happy to say that this is the first GBF initiative which has actually come to fruition. And uh, thank you very much, uh, IIT Bombay, uh, Professor Devang Kakkar, for all the support, uh, and uh, the colleagues in the various departments uh, for the support for this uh, idea. Uh, of course, the idea is not new, but uh, you know, as, as you heard one of our engineers say, uh, alumnus uh, say about the worldly bridge, you know, just like the uh, lawyers think they know everything, the engineers also think they know everything. <laughs> Uh, so I think this will be a place where uh, you know engineers and uh, social scientists can come together and uh, come up with uh, uh, not policies but at least you know uh, uh, let people make informed choices. You know one of the things which I think uh, as an institute of technology we can offer is uh, provide tools for uh, you know making these kind of policies, uh, gathering data. Of course, even data can be you know spurious as uh, the uh, nation found out yesterday when the prime minister said some village has been electrified which actually wasn't true so i think you know the way we collect data also is uh, important and maybe you know uh, somebody talked about artificial intelligence i mean th there is uh, probably uh, you know uh, a role for technology uh, in this data collection uh, i think ashank i was Ashank was here a little while back, he's just left, yeah. Uh, we, we uh, you know, uh, recently were involved in funding a company whose actually, their job is mind reading. Basically, you know, they'll uh, uh, troll your, uh, you know, uh, uh, consumers and tell you, you know, uh, where to advertise and what to advertise. So I think a lot of uh, technology can uh, come uh, to play a positive role in uh, social sciences. And uh, I, I see a you know long and a fruitful future. Uh, I'm not sure about the Ashiana. Uh, the Ashiana is already here, thanks to some alumni. Uh, but Abudana certainly uh, uh, we should take care of. Uh, not the GM variety, but the uh, local uh, indigenous variety of uh, Dana. And I'm sure the alumni will uh, you know. Uh, rise up to the occasion and do whatever is required for that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kakkar, IIT Bombay, and Satish Agnihotra.